everyone. It's Leslie Rogowski here, creative director for The Beadsmith, doing another fun workshop for you with spoiled rotten beads. I am in chilly Philly, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on the east coast of the U.S., and it is cold here. Not as cold even as it is in the middle of the United States, where unfortunately lots of people are out of power and it's just frigid weather. So it's nice to be here in my warm studio doing a workshop for you. Um, many thanks to Juliet for inviting me again. And uh, with, with a very fun project for you guys today. So I'll give everybody a few minutes to, to come in and it's only eight o'clock in the morning here. I know it's lunchtime there um, in the UK, but wherever you are around the world, welcome. Thanks for getting up early or staying up late <laughs> and uh, joining us today for the Banded Bangle Workshop. Hi everyone, I see we have some people coming in. Singapore, Rakia, wow, thank you. And there's my partner in crime, Leslie Pope, is signing in from another part of Philadelphia. Um, she and I are Team Leslie at the Beadsmith. It's uh, very fun to be working with a clone of each other. And um, nothing like having a job that you get to work with a friend. With beads! Woohoo! So she's here to... Um, Hold my hand virtually. <laughs> so yes, I'm in my home studio here um, with all kinds of uh, beady things and personal treasures. You can see, I guess, on over here, my, my Maleficent dragon and my beadsmith sign and uh, all kinds of stuff. Scotland, hi, Elaine. Good morning from New Jersey, Lisa. Well, we've got a few people in. Um, we'll give people a chance to, to get in and get settled, and uh, then I'll get started. Just, just chit-chat. I'm going to um, minimize my face so you can see my bead mat and get a little preview of what we're going to do. I know Juliet has put together these particular colors in a fabulous bundle and also the colors that I'm going to be using in the demo today. This project features the Mayuki Galvanized Duracoat, Duracoat Galvanized colors in size 11 and size 8s and they're just yummy. They're absolutely yummy. There's, there's colors for everyone, whatever your faves. And the good thing, in case you don't know what is special about the Duracoat Galvanized, is the process Meat preserves the color and the finish. So, especially in a bracelet like this, where you're going to be rubbing it against your skin over and over as you take it on and off, the color is not going to come off. That's the magic. The Duracoats have opaque finishes, matte finishes, frosted finishes. They're silver-lined beads. Um, just everything your little beady heart desires. <clears throat> so, who else do we have here? Anita. Anita's from South Africa. Hi, everybody down in South Africa. Oh, my goodness. It's a global community. Isn't it fun to be part of this community? So five after, people can join. Remember you that you can see this again and get the free tutorial on the Spoilt Rotten website. Also, today Juliet is offering a 10% discount to you guys on the bundles that she has put together. So go to the website and find that information. Take advantage of the 10% off that she's offering uh, to you special people who are joining us today. 
All right, here we go. The banded bangle is tubular herringbone. So if you haven't done this stitch before, you're going to be able to learn it and see how easy it is. Now, it, it's a very zen process, this bracelet, because it's a repetitive process. So that makes it fun, I think, to do. Um, it does take a little bit of time, so you're just going to be able to um, have some patience. And no rush, let the world go away, work on your tubular herringbone. The tutorial has, let's see if I can get this in there. There we go. You can see it has all these full color instructions that take you step by step through the steps of tubular herringbone, how you start and how you finish. So that's exactly what I'm going to show you today is how you start. I'm going to do enough so you can see what happens when you change colors and sizes because you go from size 8s to size 11s, which gives it the nice texture, the in and out um, appearance. And then I'm going to show you how to connect it so you have an endless bangle. I'm using size 12 beading needles. You could probably use um, a slightly larger beading needle, a, a 11 or 10, um, but I find that this just helps me get through. The 11s are kind of small. You use two colors of size 8s. So I'm going to use our demo colors. I have this fabulous frosted cobalt AB blue. Let's see if I can show you, bring this up. I know it's hard in the tube, but you can see that it's just this wonderful, wonderful color blue with that bit of AB. Then I have the gold galvanized Duracoat gold in size eights. And I decided to use two colors of size 11s. So in the green bangle that was on Juliet's website, I just used one color, this silver lined celery color of the 11s. But have some fun with this. I chose two colors for the blue bracelet. I have mermaid blue 11s, Duraco galvanized, and the dark lilac, which is that purple that's so hard to find, that true purple. So I have alternate the blue and purple and made sure that the length of my bangle allowed me to complete that pattern of, of alternating the colors. You're gonna work with lots of pieces of thread. So be comfortable ending and adding thread. So I have my size 12 needle. I'm using Fireline. I don't wanna have any stretch to this. So I'm using six pound Fireline just black in this case. You want to use either black or crystal or even the green, whatever's going to recede into your work and blend in. So I see, yes, there's the discount. The um, discount is announced again with a link uh, in the chat window. I see Juliet has posted that, so make sure that you check into that. So when you start with herringbone, I'm going to start my bangle with columns. If you can see here, the beads are stacked one above the other, and I refer to these as columns. Now you can work with one at a time to start, but I like to work two at a time because it gives me a more solid base when I connect my bangle at the end. So I'm going to pick up We'll have two size eights in each column. So I'm going to pick up four. Now you can string a stopper bead if you'd like. I work by wrapping this around my finger to hold my bead and give me some control. So I have four eights and I'm going to go back through the four eights again. and pull the beads so they're stacked 
next to each other like this. Now I'm going to knot my tail and working thread just once. Now I want you to notice how the beads are stacked and they won't behave for the camera. There you go. So my thread's coming out the bottom where the tail is. I'm going to go back up that second stack, that second column. So my tail and my working thread are coming out opposite sides of that first section of the bangle. Now I'm going to pick up two more blue. <coughs> and go around. To add that column and I'm going to go back down the column. So we're working in a circular motion and we're going to reverse direction each time. I'm going to do this until I have eight columns. Tubular herringbone can work with a variety of numbers of columns around but I didn't want my bangle to get too squishy. And with eight, this is the section we're working on now, this first section. And you can see that it gets squishy because you have more space in there. But don't worry when you wear the bangle, it really holds its round shape. So I have three columns. I'm going to pick up my fourth column of two beads and my thread's coming out the bottom. So I'm going to go around and come down and then go up out the fourth one. And I'm going to keep doing this until I have eight. Whoops. Picked up too many. Because I was watching my hands on camera and not on my mat. Take one off. So this is how you would start flat herringbone too. You're just going to make that strip. Now I have five. Coming out the bottom, going out the stack, the column that I just added. Six. So you're always going to go in opposite directions, around and around. Seven. You want to make sure that there's not a lot of space in between your little columns. So as you add it, you can kind of put your fingers in between the last column and the column you just added and push them together and push them together and now I'm on the eighth one. Now we're going to start our two. You're going to bring the ends together like this. My thread's coming out the top of my piece, the last set, the last column. I'm going to go down through the first column that I made and up through the column, the last column. So now I have things connected into a ring like this. Now some people find when they work something that's tubular that it helps to put something that's round inside it to help hold its shape. If you want to put a little dowel rod or something just to keep it from squishing, you can roll up a piece of paper and have it in there. You won't really need it for very long. Um, I'm not going to use that for this demo, but you can do that. That's a little tip. Now in this bracelet, we have five rows of eights. 
And when you look at the bracelet, and we'll use the colors, you can see that I have two rows of blue or rounds because they're going around, two rounds of color A, blue, and then a band of your second color, and then two rows of the first color. So you have five rows in two colors. So the next color I'm going to pick up is my gold, and I'm going to pick up two, <clears throat> but once you have these two starter rows done, you're going to work a row or a round at a time. You're not going to work with the two together. So remember I picked up the four to start and I was working. Now I'm going to pick up the two color B and I'm coming out of my column. I'm going to go down through just one bead one bead and adding those two and coming out one bead over in the next column. Now notice how the gold beads are kind of, they don't sit completely parallel and that's why it's called herringbone. You're going to find that your beads are going to sit askew. And that's part of the interesting texture of herringbone. So I have my two eights and I'm going to pick up two more. I'm coming out of one column and I'm going to go down through one bead in the next column. So you're going to have actually four pair going around. When you come through the one bead, then you move over to the next column around and go up through one bead. Pick up two eights. Go down through one bead in the next column. Move over and come out through one bead. Pick up your fourth pair, so that's your seventh and eighth bead, and now you're coming around, you're going to meet, you're going to go coming out the top, you're going to go down through one bead, so it looks like that. Now to step up, you're going to go over to the next column and you're going to go through the one blue and the first bead in this third round that you added. So you're coming up when you end your round, you're going to come out two beads. Do you see how that's through two? Now I just have the one round of that second color, so I'm going to do my next round, the next two rounds, with the color blue again to follow my pattern. I'm coming out of one of the gold, the color B. I'm going to go down through one bead. And you do kind of want to just nudge them so, even though they're sitting at angles, they're going to look like little tires sitting on the ground or little donuts sitting on your plate. So I've come down through the one gold. I'm going to come out through, <clears throat> excuse me, the one gold, the next one. Pick up two, color A. Coming out of the one gold, I'm going to go down through the next one over in the next column and I'm going to turn and come up through the one after that and keep adding my pairs of beads. Coming out one, 
going in one. And you do want to nudge them so that they sit at least somewhat parallel. Now I'm coming out the next one. Picking up two more blue. Going down one bead. Now I'm around to the front again, to the first set that I picked up. One, two, three, four, so there's eight beads. Now I need to step up, so I go through two beads. The gold, like I had done for most of the rest of the round, in the previous round, and the first one that I just added in this round. And kind of wiggle it. Make sure your beads are all pulled nice. There we go. And you can see that they're they're sticking out a little bit. They they kind of splay out. And that's exactly the way it's supposed to look. We're going to do one more round with the size 8s and then change to the size 11s and you're going to see what happens to the shape. Coming out of one blue, I'm picking up two blue and going down through the next blue. And you can see those columns there forming nice. Moving around the two come out one, pick up two, go down through the next one, get them to sit on top. And what happens is if you don't nudge those beads to sit more or less in position, your stitching is going to be loose and you're going to see more thread. Now the nature of this stitch is there's some thread that shows, but you really want to minimize it and control it. You want to be the master of this. So I added that. Now I'm going to come up the next one blue. Two more. Picked up. Go down through one. Nudge them so they sit on top of the column. Come out through one, the next one. Pick up the last two in this round. And here's another tip. Sometimes, can you guys see how there's a difference in the width of these beads? Every now and then you're going to find a mutant. When you're working in most stitches, but especially in herringbone, where they're sitting side by side, you want to discard those skinnier beads and save them. You never know when you're going to need something to fit. But you don't want to use them in your piece because it's going to throw the alignment off of all the rounds. So I'm going to take that skinny bead and I'm going to put it in my little orphan bowl where I put my, my discards. And I'm going to pick up two beads that are more similar in their size. Coming out one bead, I've picked up the two and I'm going down the next single bead. <clears throat> now I'm around to the beginning again. So you can see I have my columns. And I'm going to come out two beads. So we have the first section of our size eights. Let's move to 11s. The stitch is exactly the same. You're just going to have to use a little bit of different tension. Pick up two 11s, sew through one, down through one, and you can see how it pulls in a little bit. Let's get this focus. There it is. You can see that. I'm going to come out the next eight, 
pick up two 11s, go down through one bead, and you really want to make sure that these beads are pulled. So what I do after each stitch, because I don't know if you can see this, but there's kind of a lot of thread showing in between the two columns of the eights. So the beads that I just added, I'm going to grab a hold of them and pull them to snug the space between the eights. And then I'm going to adjust my working thread. Coming out the next single eight. And you want to also look at your 11s to make sure they're equal in their size and shape as well. Even with the Mayuki, and I'm going to pull that stitch. Even, <clears throat> even Mayuki beads, sometimes there's mutants. Coming out one, going down, picking up two, going down one. Okay, now I'm around to the end where I'm coming, I'm back at the first columns where I added the 11s. Remember, you go up two, so I'm going to be going up an eight and the first 11 that I added. Give the camera a chance to focus there. There we go. Now this bracelet calls for three rounds of size 11s. By doing that, I figured out that I can make a bracelet that fits easily over my hand. Um, it makes like kind of like a size eight. So the bangles, just talk about sizing here for a little bit. The bangle has to fit over the widest part of your hand, which tends to be here, like right where your thumb comes in to your hand. So you wanna be able to roll it over easily and it does hang loose, hangs down a little bit on your hand when you wear it, but you can get it on and off. So I figured out that three rounds of 11s between each of the five rounds of eights will work to create an equal pattern around. If you need a bigger bracelet, you can add a fourth round of 11s or you can be a little sneaky and at the very end, you can adjust by adding one more row in each round for the last couple sections and no one's gonna know but you. Okay. So I have one round of 11s and I'm gonna go for my second round, picking up two 11s, Coming out of one bead, going down through one bead. Now I'm going out through one bead and I'm just going to come out through that 11, the first 11 that I added in that previous round. And I'm going to pull it nice and snug because you want to minimize the thread between the columns. Pick up two 11s, coming out of one 11, going through 111 in the previous round. I'm going to take those 11s and I'm going to pull them. And why am I not just yanking on my thread? Because it pulls against the edges of the beads and it, even though Fireline is my favorite go-to thread for its durability, it'll help you to control the, the pull if you pull close to where you want to minimize that thread. So I came down through the 111, I'm going up through the next 11. Adding two 11s, going down through one 11. Um, I'll yank those beads that I just added, coming out through the next 11. And adding my last two 11s in this, the second round of 11s. So I want you to see how 
They look like they're loose. Let's see if I can show you. Yeah. You can see how the columns sort of splay out. And that's okay because you connect them in the next round. Now I'm finished with this second round of 11s and I'm going to come out two beads. In this case, it's the two 11s. And this, by the way, is all there is to tubular herringbone. You're going to go around and around and around. One more round. Let's get one more round <clears throat> with the 11s. There's a mutant. Get rid of that one. So I'm coming out of the first bead in that pair, going down through one bead. You're going to have to start to nudge them into position, coming out this one bead in the next column, picking up two, coming down through one bead, there we go. Nudging those beads so they sit like little tires stacked. Coming out through one. Picking up two and going down through one. Coming out one. Going down through one. Going over to the next column, picking up two, coming out of the one bead. So you can see, there we go, going down through one. And then we're going to step up, coming down through one, there we go. <laughs> All right, so we're back to the beginning and we're going to step up sewing through the top two 11s in the next pair. And you can see how now we have a piece where the 11s had pulled in to form that little waist. And you're going to start with the eights again. And it's going to be a little bit wider. And as you work each time, pulling in those 11s is what helps give this particular design this nice in and out texture. So how's that? I make it look so easy. Thanks, Anita. <laughs> Hi, Cora. Uh, Cora is uh, watching us. She is one of our Inspiration Squad designers. So you just keep doing that. This does take some time. I will tell you it is not hard, but it will take you a few hours to do each round and you want to take your time. Remember beating's not a race. I have determined like after you do a certain amount you're going to want to put it around your hand to see how much more you need in order to get it to fit easily I mean it can be sort of snug but over the widest part of your hand that's going to vary depending on each of you you know how I started with the eights you want to end with a section of elevens because now we're going to bring the ends together to form the bangle. And this is no different than the stitch that you've been doing, but you're not picking up new beads. You're going to come from your last rounds of 11, and instead of picking up a new bead, you're going to sew through the beads 
at the end, at the other end of your bracelet. So here's the only tricky part to doing this. You want to make sure your bracelet is not twisted. So you're going to lay it down on your workspace. And I keep my working thread coming out on top so I can track where I'm going to sew for right now. And you can see the two columns of beads. I'm going to bring it up here and squish it for you. So you can see that my working thread is coming out the left of these two columns of 11s. And what I'm going to do when I lay this back down is I'm going to carefully follow those columns all the way around to find the corresponding columns at the end of the bracelet. And I'm going to hold on to that and make sure when I bring these together that they're both facing up. Is that clear to everybody? Okay. So here's my thread coming out of the 11. Let's see if I can hold this up. Here's my thread coming out of the 11. And there's the two pairs of eights. So I'm just going to like you were picking up beads, but I'm going to sew through the 1 8 on the end and back down through it as if you were stringing there, stringing two eights. And then sew into the 11. So it's just like you strung those two eights, you came out of the 11 went through those eights, and you're going to come back down through the other 11. You know, it's always so hard to do this when you're trying to sew somebody else. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to put it down. There we go. Now I'll hold it up again so you can see Do you see how I just used those eights? Like they were new beads. And I came down through the 111. Now, just like we had been doing before, now I'm going to come out through 111, moving around the tube, coming back out. And make sure when you do this, you're watching your beadwork. So when you're coming out that 11, you're going to go into the next eight over. You're not skipping any. And then the whole bangle turns. Remember, that's only one, so you want to come out like you're stringing the second bead in the new round, but you're using the existing one. And you also want to check to make sure when you go into the other side, the previous round, you're going through the right bead. And you're going to continue doing this all the way around. Out the next 11. And then you're going to pick up or string the existing next two and go into the next 11 over in the other end. So it's the same stitch. You're just not picking up new beads. You're using, you're sewing through the beads in the end. And that's how you connect this to make the bangle look completely seamless. When you're finished, you need to know how to end and add thread a couple times, I had said in the beginning. 
What I do to end an ad thread is I will sew through some of the beads and I'll make a half hitch around existing thread. A half hitch means, I'll show you on this little piece. If I needed to end an ad thread now here, I would go into my piece under an existing piece of thread and sew through the loop that's formed. And then I would sew the end in and trim it. And if I'm gonna start a piece of thread, let's get a little piece here. I get to show you my needle threading trick because I'm sewing, I'm going to add a piece of thread. Grab a chain nose pliers or a flat nose pliers. Take your thread, squash the end so it's flat, which makes it the same shape as the slot, the eye of the needle. And you're going to pull your thread down until you can barely see it between your fingers. Like a poppy seed, I say. Take the eye of the needle, bring it right down to the thread and usually it leaves the thread no place to go but through the eye of the needle. So there you go. So you have your new piece of thread and I'm going to start it down in my piece. Say I want to come out this 11 to resume my stitches. I'm going to start it down a little ways into the piece, leave a little tail and I'm going to sew a half hitch around an existing thread. So there's already a loop of thread between these beads and I'm going to come around and make a half hitch. And I would actually start down a little further and I would do that a couple times and then come out just right through the beads where you want your thread to resume your stitching. That's all there is to adding an ending thread. Now there's another trick. I don't know how many people know about the Thread Zap. The Thread Zapper is a fabulous tool. I'm using the retractable version. It's operated on a couple batteries. There's a little filament. Let's see, you probably won't be able to see this turning red. Here's my thread splicing method. I do not remember who taught me this, but let me tell you, it is the best. You're going to take your two threads that you want to splice. There. And you're going to tie them in a square knot. And you don't need to have a lot of thread left over. You're going to knot your new thread to your old thread. Come on, my hands are cold. Not as cold as yours in Texas, I can guarantee, but okay, let's do this. New thread and old thread. Tie it in a square knot. Take the ends and zap them down to a short little tails. Then you take your thread zapper and you're going to just touch it to the end and ball up the ends of your thread. Do you see that? That's because the fire line is synthetic, so it melts and it forms these little barriers so that you can then, oh, of course I just pulled it off. You can splice the threads together. That's my fault and sometimes that happens. So I'm going to do it again because I want you to see how cool this is. Never fails, right, Leslie Pope, when you're trying to demo something that you've done a bazillion times. Okay, there's my square knot. What that means is I didn't make the 
the little fused ball end enough. Touch it to the end. Touch it to the end. That'll work. Then when you pull them tight, can you see that? You have a little tiny little knot that's now very snug and you can and you have your new thread and you can string your new thread on your needle and continue. So my point was that you will have to end and add thread a few times in this. You can use the sew through half hitch method or you can splice your thread and just make sure that you pull the knot through, you know, the little splice part. You want to pull it through so it's not going to show. And when you're all finished, there you go. You can't wear too many of these, right? So, how was that? That's the banded bangle. Again, remember, Juliet's offering 10% off. If you go to her website um, to buy the bundle, there's a free pattern available for you. That's my pattern with my illustrations for the banded bangles. Nice picture on the front. My website if you want to check out more of my work. And of course, beadsmith.com forward slash I love beads has lots of other patterns too. And I know that Juliet has all the beads that you're going to need for that. So, Christine, yes, you will have to buy a zapper. That's the retractable one's really nice because you don't, um, the, the filament gets to stay inside. Uh, the batteries are in here. There's also a spare little filament on the inside of the, the lid. So it's very handy. There's a little safety feature, a little belt that goes on here that I'm sure my cat has under our sofa somewhere by now. Yep. Okay, I think my cat was trying to come in. All right. Are there any other questions? Thank you so much for joining us from all over the world on behalf of Spoilt Rotten Beads in the UK and the Beadsmith, a global wholesaler. Myself, Leslie Rogowski, stay safe, stay warm, stay creative. We love beads. Bye, you guys.